He's one of these hidden masters in the internet marketing world. An incredible knowledge of numbers. Hi, it's Daryl Urbanski here. As a consultant, I've been helping businesses grow for over 17 years, from zero to the first 100,000, up to $7 million in growing. You've, you've taken uh, businesses that were about to go under and put in a few key systems and structures that then turn them into multi-million dollar companies. For them, the investment was worth it. And right now, I wanna make a ridiculous offer to help you for just a single dollar. That's right, only $1 for a personalized business health check Grow your business into a beast in your market. A lot of gurus out there um, that present you a lot of the, the why and the what, but they don't necessarily give you the how. And and what I really found with Daryl's presentation, there's no holding back the screens or the curtains, like everything was given to, to really assist us. Let's pull back the curtain and see what's working for you and what needs your immediate attention. Go to bestbusinesscoach.ca forward slash health check and sign up for your $1 business health check. This offer expires soon and you'll kick yourself if you miss it. Hi, I'm Daryl Urbanski and welcome to the Best Business Podcast. My mission is to help create 200 new multi-millionaire business owners. How? You'll do better when you know better. In my interviews, you'll hear from self-made millionaires, seven-figure business owners, authors, and world-class experts sharing how they did it so you can too without experiencing the same obstacles they did. Now, if you like this interview, please share it with a friend you think will benefit. They'll appreciate it and I will as well. You can also connect with me on social media. Look for Daryl Urbanski, D-A-R-Y-L, Urban Ski, U-R-B-A-N-S-K-I, and add me so we can be friends. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy what I've prepared for you right here, right now. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always, and today we are joined by Nathan Hirsch. Nathan is a serial entrepreneur plus expert in remote hiring and e-commerce. He started his first e-commerce business out of his college dorm room and has sold over 30 million in products online. He is now the co-founder and CEO of FreeEup.com, a marketplace that connects businesses with pre-vetted freelancers in e-commerce, digital marketing, and much more. I've asked him to join us here today to help us with our team building efforts because as we all know, business is a team sport. So Nathan, thank you for joining us. How are you doing, my friend? Daryl, I am doing great. How are you? Thanks for I'm, having me. I'm good. I'm good. It's an honor and a pleasure. I think this is a fantastic topic. I also think it's a really important topic. Uh, really, uh, something that's really come to been or been close to my heart lately is the concept of multiple teams of income. So anything I could talk about team building and outsourcing and delegating and, and working effectively with a, a group to accomplish business goals is really important in my books. I certainly hope the listeners are here and they've got their pens and pencils ready. But before we jump into that, how, what were you, how, how did you even get started? You, you started your first business when you were in, in your college dorm. Do you come from an entrepreneurial family? Is this something that was like bred into you as a child? So my parents were actually both teachers. Oh. <laughs> so I always grew up with the mentality that I was going to um, go to school, get good grades, get into college, graduate, get a job, work for 40 years. <laughs> and mm. when I I, I kind of rebelled against that. I, I, my dad taught in the town next to me, which mm -hmm. was a town full of kids that their parents were doctors, lawyers, dentists, big business owners. And I wasn't poor by any means, but um, my parents were both teachers compared to that. So as a kid, I was always kind of looking up and wanting what I didn't have. And during the summers, my parents made me work these 40 hour a week summer jobs and mm. I hated it. All my friends were outside playing. I was stuck inside working, mm -hmm. but I learned so much. I mean, about customer service and sales and um, just managing people. But I also realized that I was going to be miserable working for other people. I, I just mm. was not that kind of person. So when I got to college and I went to Quinnipiac University, I, I kind of looked at it as a ticking clock. If if I didn't figure out a way how to start a business before I graduated, I was going to work for corporate for the rest of my life and be very unhappy. So I started hustling right from the beginning. And I started off buying and selling people's textbooks. I competed against our school bookstore. I thought they were ripping people off, created a little referral program. Um, had Before I knew it, I lined out the door of people trying to sell me their books to the point where I actually got a cease and desist letter from my school to knock it off because um, I was stealing too much of their business. So <laughs> yeah, that was my first glimpse into being an entrepreneur and books led me to Amazon. Um, I started experimenting with outdoor equipment and sporting goods and um, DVDs and computer games, everything that a 20 year old guy is familiar with. And I just failed over and over and over. The only thing I could get to sell were these books. 
And it wasn't until I branched out of my comfort zone and, and experimented with the baby product um, category that I started to have a lot of success. So if you can imagine me as a 20-year-old single college guy um, selling millions of dollars worth of baby products out of my college dorm room, that was me. And I mean, <laughs> people thought I was crazy. If you looked at my computer, it was just tabs and tabs of, of baby products. And I would spend eight hours a day listing. And this business scaled so quickly it was time for me to start paying taxes. And I didn't know anything about that. So I met with an accountant. And one of the first things that he, that he asked me was, when are you going to hire your first person? And I kind of laughed him off I, or shrugged him off. I was like, why would I do that? Um, I don't want to train them. I don't want to take money out of my pocket. They won't do as good as I will. Um, all, all the excuses that entrepreneurs mm -hmm. normally have. Mm -hmm. And he just laughed in my face. <laughs> and he said, you're going to learn this lesson on your own. Well, sure enough, I, my first busy season comes around and I don't know what busy season is. I get destroyed. I'm working 20 hours a week. My social life is gone. My grades plummet. And I somehow make it out to January stressed out of my mind. And I think to myself, I can never let that happen again. So I post a job mm -hmm. and one of the first people that applies, it, it goes awesome. He's a great hire. He's smart. He's crushing it. He's my business partner, Connor. We've been working together for 10 years. Mm. We hit the ground running right from the beginning. So I get lucky, but I think hiring is easy, right? You just post a job and first person to show up, you hire them and you grow your business. Well, I proceed to make <laughs> bad hire after bad hire after bad hire. <laughs> and, and I quickly realized that college kids, not very reliable mm -hmm. and no 30 year old person wants to work with me. So I get thrown into the remote hiring world uh, based on necessity. And I learn the Upworks, the Fivers of the world. I get pretty good at hiring, but I realize just how much time it takes to go through all the applicants and find what you want. Mm -hmm. So I had the idea of building my own marketplace free up, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But that's how I kind of went from a broke college kid to starting two companies. That's awesome. That's awesome. So that's a fantastic path to have gone. And I think anyone here can relate to having had a bad hire or the frustration with, you know, even if it's not their fault, getting out of your head and into some sort of training program or process or documents so you can train them like what it is you want them to do. That seems to be a really difficult step to like to, you know, to to. That's something I've noticed, a lot of owners. And, and for anyone that's listening to this, running a remote team is actually a really effective thing to do because it forces you to do that. It forces you to get things down in documentation and clearly express your ideas and content and realize how unclear you are as an employer, how terrible you are as a boss in giving instructions, no matter how good you think. When someone's not there beside you and they can't just watch and ask questions and you know as easily in real time. So that's a real advantage that you have as a business if you're trying to scale or grow a team because you create documentation right from the get-go whenever it's an, a remote team or virtual team scenario. So now, <clears throat> what do you think have been some of the biggest challenges you faced in your business career? You talked about hiring, but what were some of the biggest challenges just overall, not even just hiring, as you grew and progressed, well, like between when you started to now, do you feel like there's been like a, a journey of milestones that you've overcome? Definitely. So, it, I mean, every entrepreneur, you get to the point where you're successful and you've made money and, and you're running a business and people see the success. They don't really see every every mistake and everything that you've kind of overcome. So right. one of the one of the biggest mistakes that I, I've made that I've kind of learned from, and, and it does have to do a little bit with hiring, but not 100 percent with. So. As I grew this business, I had this idea that I wanted to manage the day. I wasn't sleeping well. The business was 24-7. It was stressing me out. I needed someone that I could work really well with. So I hired someone, and I t spent six months training them. I taught them how to do orders, listing, customer service. On the other side of my business, I had this one manufacturer that I was really good at selling their products. And I had some other ones, but I was just so good at with this manufacturer, I didn't really put time and energy into the other ones. So. I spent six months working my butt off, getting the point to where the business runs without me. I don't even have to be there. I'm just making money every week. The manufacturer, I'm crushing it. This person's trained. He's a well-oiled machine following my systems and processes. Time to take my first vacation, right? Mm -hmm. um, I go to Myrtle Beach. On the first day of Myrtle Beach, I get three phone calls. One from my employee <laughs> telling me that he's quitting on me. He can no longer focus on the business. Two from the manufacturer telling me that they dropped me and they no longer want to work with me. Three from my accountant telling me that someone had filed a fake tax return in my name and I was going to have to deal with that mess when I got back. <laughs> so Yay. I went from this 
Yeah, this unbelievable high that I'm this 20 year old entrepreneur crushing it to let's just start completely over again from scratch. And I mean, I was, it was devastating. You, you kind of, <laughs> you kind of looked ahead and think, okay, time to go get a real job. But we went back, we figured out, Hey, we have X amount of money. What did we learn from this? We learned, let's diversify. Let's not put all our eggs in one basket. Let's depart, depart, uh, departmentalize our mm -hmm. hiring. Mm -hmm. And when we're dealing with manufacturers, let's reach out to lots and continue to add manufacturers. So if they ever drop us and it wouldn't be the last one that did, we're protected. So mm -hmm. that was definitely something we overcame back in the day. Mm, mm, mm. That sounds, yeah, that's a really powerful thing. So what would you recommend to anyone that's listening who's starting out or maybe even struggling? Like they're, they've got a business, they're, you know, they got some sales coming through the door, they need to grow their cash flow, but there's not enough hours in the day. And, you know, what, what would you recommend to them? So there's two ways to go about hiring. The first way is figure out how to get your hours back. And a good place to start is creating a list of everything you do on a day-to-day, -day, week to week, month to month basis and prioritize it by stuff that's easy but takes up a lot of your time and figure out how do you get two hours in your day back, 10 hours in your week back, whatever it is. Um, the other way to hire and one of the best activities that Connor and I do um, once a year is we sit down and we say, you're bad at this. And we're brutally honest with each other and we write it all down. And at the end, we, we normally realize that we complement each other very well, which is great. But we also have this list of things that we're not good at, yet we're doing them every single day. So mm. what we do is we hire specialists and we hire experts to turn those weaknesses into strengths. Mm. So as you're going about your business, you're going to have to hire. It's the only way to get to the next level. At some point, you have to identify, hey, do I, am I outsourcing? Am I hiring VAs to take these tasks off my plate? Or do I need a, an expert or a specialist to turn that weakness into a strength? And that's what will accelerate your business. Mm, mm, mm. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay. So are, what are the top things that uh, people tend to want to outsource? <laughs> That's my least favorite question, only because there, there's no rhyme or reason. I mean, every business is in a different place, right? You've got three levels of people. You've got the followers, which is the outsource, the five to ten dollars an hour, non-US. You got the mid-level, the specialists, the bookkeepers, the graphic designers who they do the same thing every day and you're hiring them to do just do that thing, not to consult with you. And you got the experts. 25 and up that can consult and project manage and everything that goes with it. And everyone's at a different point in their business. Sometimes you need a doer to knock projects off, or you need a follower to get your hours back, or you need an expert to avoid that big mistake or point you in the right direction. And I mean, even by the amount of requests that we get, there's no rhyme or reason to that either. It's all over the place. We might get 70 requests in a day, and, and there's no pattern. Every business is at a different point. So what you need to do is you need to focus on, hey, do I need that follower? Do I need that doer? Or do I need that expert? And then figure out the tasks that make sense for that hire in your business. Mm, I love that. So you gave us three categories. You gave us a follower, a doer, and an expert. Can you break that down again a little bit? When would When do you hire each? Yeah. So the follower is when you have a lot of tasks on your plate and you have the systems, you have the processes, you have the SOPs, maybe a document in place for people to follow your system. If you haven't built that system yet, then you're going to struggle with those people. And let's take customer service, for example. <clears throat> I have a customer service system. I have a document that is how I do it. I can hire someone with five years of customer service experience, but the way that you do customer service, Daryl, is going to be different than the way that I do. So I need to teach them to do it my way and to follow my system. Right. The mid-level people are normally project-based. The graphic design, bookkeeping, content writers, and you might find someone that um, spends 10 hours a day writing Amazon listings. That's what their specialty is. And you're not coming in and teaching them what to do. You can always give them feedback and tweak what it is, but for the most part, they're doing it their way. And they're not really consulting with you. They're not giving you the long-term vision. They're just doing that project and getting it done. Mm. And the expert is where that game planning comes in. Someone who can come in, audit your business, ask you the right questions, figure out some different options, let you maybe make a decision, and then execute from there. And that might include project managing, managing other people, creating those systems and processes for the basic level people. It, it, it really is relative to are they, hey, are they looking at your entire business or parts of your business? So, so it sounds like the expert is when you have no clue what's going on and what you're doing and you just need like you just need some love and like a helping hand the doer is when you have an idea but it's not well refined or pro you know it's not a refined process it's not something you do five times a day every day 
And so you don't really know like how long it should take to be done, that sort of thing. But the follower is when you've got an SOP, got a checklist, you have some sort of training on it, and you know how long it should take so you can easily manage someone. They can you can take a low level skill level person and you know and and have them do it and hold them accountable to get this many done in this much time frame. Is that accurate? Yeah, and keep in mind these are real people. They don't always fit into perfect levels, but it's more about figuring out a vision of, hey, let's not hire someone for five bucks an hour who's a follower to run my Facebook ads and and just not do a good job for me. And it's also about the mentality that, hey, yes, I could spend the next six months becoming a Facebook ad expert. We're relatively smart people. We could figure it out, but that's not a good use of our time. It makes a lot more sense to hire an expert to come in who can crush it right from the beginning so that I can focus on my core competency. Right. Yep. Yep. No, that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. So what do you see are some of the greatest mistakes your clients and other entrepreneurs making when they come to your site and they get, they, you know, they get started? <laughs> so there, there's really two main ways that people go wrong. Uh, besides not diversifying, which we kind of already talked about, the first way is not really understanding what you want. Really, uh, we talked about the different levels, and obviously knowing that's important, but there's more than that. It's, hey, what's your budget? The last thing you want to do is hire someone and run out of budget in two weeks after you've already wasted time on them. Hey, what hours do you want them to work? Is it flexible? Is it set? How many hours a week? What kind of person, what kind of culture do you work well with? I obviously talk very fast. I move very fast. I have very high expectations. I, I'm a very direct when I talk to people. If I hire someone that's warm and fuzzy and emotional, and I, I've learned from that, that's not a good fit for me. So really <laughs> identifying what your perfect person looks like is going to save you a lot of hassle down the line. The second thing is expectations. After the hire, a lot of people dive right into it and they get to the point down the line and they, they come to me and I've had clients who will come to me with a hire they made outside free up and they're like, hey, I'm a, I'm a month and a half in with this person. I've invested time. I've invested money. Like, well, it's not working out. What would you do differently? And my answer is I would never let it get to the point where a month and a half in, I realize they're not a good fit. Mm. I need to set set those expectations early, get on the same page, black and white, what's expected, what's not okay, what my pet peeves are, how we communicate. And I want to figure out if they're a good fit on day one, two, three, four, not a month and a half down the line. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Got it. Okay. Now, how about managing on go like on a regular basis? In terms of how to do it? Well, just so you've got a staff member, you've got them doing something and you think they're doing a good job. How do you know? Like I, I know that I've, I've been hiring online for nine, 10 years now, and I've got systems that I use. So I already kind of know the answer that I use for this, but I know for myself, in my earlier days, that if I had a bad day, I would hate my staff. And if I was having a good day, I would love my staff. And it wasn't always actual, but actually based on real results. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't so much I was object, uh, I was objection, objectional. I don't know why I'm stumbling on that. But you know what I mean? I wasn't, I wasn't qualitative in it. It was very subjective that's what i want to say like to my mood or how i felt about how my day would you know like if i if things were great i I love my team but sometimes uh and that's what i mean there's a lot of people especially if they're new to hiring they'll blame or hold staff accountable for things they didn't explain clearly you know what i mean like is there a way that you can uh, any sort of tips for helping manage people in a, in a you know in a fair manner yeah. So I've never had a real job, right? The only real life experience I had was at my internship at Aaron's and Firestone. And when I worked at Firestone, I had a manager who was down your throat at all times. He was stressing everyone out. He would talk down to people. He would, everything you don't want a manager to be. Right. But when I started my business, that was the only kind of manager I knew, right? Like I had to base my managerial style off mm-hmm. that because he was good at what he did. He made the business money. People didn't like him, but it was it was a successful. So mm-hmm. I started off with that mentality, and well, guess what happened? My turnover was through the roof. People were quitting on me. I got 50% turnover, and eventually what I did was – I sat down with someone, so the same person or someone quit for the same position three times in a row. So the third consecutive person for the same position mm. was walking out the door and I said, Hey, can we have an exit interview? And there's only one type of exit interview and that's an incredibly uncomfortable one, right? Right. You're, you're, yep. you're sitting, you're sitting across the table. This is back when I had an office 
sitting across the table. He's he doesn't like you. You're pissed at him for wasting all your time. But I just listened and he ripped me apart from my hiring process to my managerial style to my leadership skills skills to the culture that I was building. But I should have written that guy a check right there because that information made me th- the hundreds of thousands of dollars and saved me hundreds of thousands of dollars because it just changed everything that I did from having a, a hiring process that was much more focused on the process than, than the mm-hmm. results and the importance of building a culture and treating people right and, and having more of a collaborative effort rather than you just at the top barking orders at everyone mm-hmm. um, and how to lead and not just manage. So my tip for all that and kind of the point is, hey, we're all new entrepreneurs at some point. The only way you get better is by talking with the people you're working with, create an environment where Feedback is encouraged where people can bring ideas to the table, where people can be honest with you about how you can improve and where where you're open to doing that because managing every group of people is different. And if you keep your ears open, you can learn and adjust and figure out the best way to maximize your team. Got it. Okay. That works. So what do you see some of the best clients that you have? What are some of the commonalities, some of the best employers that are on your platform who have the most, you know, the biggest teams that are doing uh, I don't know, that are just moving and shaking and they've got the best team, the best cultures. Like, how do you do that? What do you see? Is there any commonalities you see among them? The, the commonality is when I talk to anyone that works with those clients, they love it at all times. They always feel like they're respected. They always feel like they're contributing to the greater good, even if they have a, a very tiny role or they're just doing projects here or there. They feel like everything is communicated clearly. They know what to do. They know what not to do. They know who to go to at what time. They know when to not contact the client. They know what their pet peeves are. And it it all comes down to that communication up front, kind of like you touched on before. You have to go above and beyond. You can't assume anything, especially when you're dealing with remote workers in different time zones, with different backgrounds and cultures and, and upbringing. You have to clearly express how you are as a business owner, what's important to your business and what people should follow in order to have success and what people should avoid in order to make fail in order to what people should avoid because you've had failures before. You should tell people what didn't work with other hires is what I'm trying to say. So Mm. the clients that the clients that do that efficiently at a high level, they're able to scale faster and better. Mm, mm, mm. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. So just clear communication on what you want. I think it's important that, or actually, what do you feel about, can people hire for jobs and roles that they don't know how to do? And how do you do that? You want to hire someone for something? I, Yeah, I'll let you answer that and then I'll, I'll, I'll give an example. Yeah. So it's obviously tough. And that's part of why we created free up where we do a lot of the vetting for you. But when you interview and your interview for not just skill, but attitude and communication as well, you'll have better hires. And this is why what you care about when you're hiring for skill, you don't know necessarily need a 10 out of 10 for everything because 10 out of 10s for everything gets expensive pretty fast. You can have a a 7 out of 10, a 5 out of 10, a 3 out of 10. There's a time and a place for everyone. What's important to you for the skill is that people are honest about what they can and cannot do and they only take on tasks and projects that they can do at a high level. So how do you find people like that? You vet them for the attitude and and the communication. People that have positive attitudes, who care about their client more than they care about the paycheck, who are passionate about what they do and, and actually generally love what they wake up and do every day. People can communicate at a high level and you don't have to chase down and give updates and clearly you can understand what they're doing at all times. Those are the type of people that tend to be honest about their skill set. So yes, you should do your research and figure out the right questions to ask and be able to see when it's BS. But at the same time, if you can focus on the attitude and the communication, you're also going to increase your percentage of making a good hire. Mm. So you're talking about some soft skill stuff, not just the hard skill. Like there's a very like, you know, you must be this tall to get on this ride. You must have the skills, you know, if you're hiring graphic designer or content writer or something, you must, you know, be able to work at this level. But then on top of that, there's soft skills. Now, are those more important? Like what's the difference between things that you can and can't train? And do you prioritize one over the other? So we, we don't, it, we want all three there in our mind, they're all even the skill, the attitude and the communication. The exception of that is, is if someone doesn't have the skill yet, they charge uh, what we consider would be outside of line with what the market standard is. So if someone has no customer service experience and they're in the Philippines and they're charging 25 bucks an hour, 
obviously that's a huge red flag and there's really no point adding to the marketplace. But if someone is honest about what they can do skill wise and they have a great attitude and they have great communication, there's going to be some client, no matter whether they're a three or a seven or a 10 out of 10 that needs them as long as they're priced accordingly. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now I guess let's talk about um, what are some of the most popular things? I know that you said that you didn't like that earlier, but uh, there's kind of two ones. Like what are the most popular things people outsource and what do you feel are the things people should outsource more often? Yeah. So on the lower level side, it, it's the customer service, the bookkeeping, the data entry work. I mean, if you're still doing that at some point in your business, you have to figure out a way to get out. On the mid-level side, social media, obviously huge now. Content creation. You can never have enough content in your business. Um, graphic designer and video editors, people that you can have and build your Rolodex so when you need that project, you can just go to them and you're not, you're not interviewing people when you have an immediate need. And on the advanced level, that marketing expert, that PPC expert who can run Facebook ads or Amazon ads if you're running an Amazon business, um, people that can do do web development at a high level. We live in an age of technology. If you haven't found a good, reliable web developer yet, you're, you're at a big disadvantage over your competition. So I would say those are, are the most popular, but we have over 100 skill sets on the platform. Right, right, right. But let's go through that just because I think those are great examples. So at the low level, if you're just getting started, you're Excuse me, you're trying to buy your time back. So you should be outsourcing your customer service, the accounting, any sort of data entry, simple tasks that just kind of gum up your time. You know, like monkey button pushing, not to do, not to not to demean anybody, but things that are easy to delegate to someone else and know that they'll be done to a high quality. Then moving up the ladder, you mentioned some other things like content. Why would why would I want to outsource content creation? So everyone has their core competency, right? I'm a, I'm a brutal writer. I'm not good at it. It's just not what I'm good at. I'm a process guy. I'm a customer service guy. I'm a sales guy. Content is just not my thing. And at the same time, you need content. If you're in a business like mine, we have a blog. We have social media posts that go out every day. We have we even have canned responses that we have to write for lead generation or for um, standard responses to, to email questions as we train new VAs. Mm -hmm. So there's such a need to have good writing. Um, for us, it makes sense to hire for it. Yes, even my business partner, Connor, is a great writer, but is it a good use of his time three years into the business to be writing every single thing? Probably not. Right. So we have people that we can go to for different things. And for stuff like a blog, as you grow it, it's also good to get different types of writing styles in there. People that have their own experience, their own background, where you really wouldn't be able to execute the article in the same way, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. No, that makes perfect sense. So you're creating the content, you know, and also to feed and carry your audience because people buy when they're ready to buy, not when you're ready to sell. So you might you know, have people and you know that they're an ideal candidate or they fit your target market, but they're just not at a time or place where they want to buy right now. And so you need to, a friendly, you know, a non-threatening, friendly and valuable way to stay in front of them, which can be done through content of some sort, whether you're just posting regularly on social media, whether you've got a newsletter or a blog or you're doing a podcast, something that keeps you recent in their life. So when they become ready to buy, you be, you know, you're the person they know, like, and trust and they reach out to. So that would be why I do that. And then the highlight Level, you talked about marketing and web development. Can we talk about this? Like, what's the difference between hiring someone for customer service or data entry? You, I feel like you touched on it before with the expert doer uh, follower model, but with these higher level things like outsourcing your marketing, is that something you can just give to someone and then walk away from? Not at first. I mean, Think about how many different ways there are to market your business. You can do lead generation. You can do LinkedIn ads. You can do Facebook ads. You can do billboards. You can do podcast advertisements. I mean, there's, there's many different ways. And just because something works for one business doesn't mean it'll work for yours. We all have seen the gurus and the courses out there. It's really not one size fits all. You have to figure out what makes sense for your business. Everyone is in a different niche with a, a different business model. So a lot of times hiring an expert, someone who's been in the business for five and 10 years and they've seen what works and what doesn't work is a great way to get options of what's available to you and what makes the most sense and what has the fastest ROI. Because as a startup and, and I bootstrapped two companies with less than a thousand dollars, getting that ROI quick is important that you can't do everything at once. You need to focus on your bread and butter and you can continue to add things. So hiring a marketing expert is important. Another thing that I like to do is focus on low risk, high reward situations. And an example of that is 
I'll experiment with different avenues. So I hired one agency on our platform to run my Instagram. I hired one agency to run my Twitter. And it's not that expensive. It's a few hundred dollars every month. What's the worst case scenario? I fire them after three months. I'm down 600 bucks. Yeah, it sucks, but I'm not going to be homeless. And what's the best case scenario? They grow my brand. They do a way better job than I ever could. And I start getting clients and it's been working out very well. And if you continue to focus on low risk, high reward situations and trying new things with high level people, you can see what works and put more money and more time into it and see what doesn't work and tweak and pull back. So that's what I encourage you to do as you grow your business when it comes to the marketing side, because yes, you can hire an overall marketing expert, but there's just so many different types of marketing. Sometimes you even have to hire marketing experts that specialize in one or two things to see if it'll actually work for your business. Right. Can we, I want to expand on that because I know there's a large group of people that I've dealt with in my experience that try to do things like outsource sales and marketing, but they either don't know what they're doing or don't know what they want. And so I think what you just mentioned is really important. And I think there's a couple of things too, that we also want to clarify for some people. So one, you mentioned that instead of just hiring one person, one team, one, it can be kind of, some people have said one is the worst number, number of business you hire a couple of people with the same goal in terms of sales and marketing. Was that accurate? Yeah. I mean, there, there's no right or wrong way to hire. What, right. th there's no blueprint that just works for everyone. Sometimes it does sure. take tweaking and experimenting and figure out what works for you. Obviously, while you do that, you want to be trying new things, putting yourself in position to really take off it in one or two avenues, at least at first and hopefully more later, but also protect yourself if someone leaves where it doesn't take you six months to get back on track. Right, of course. So one was hiring that. The second thing you mentioned was you're only risking a couple of hundred bucks. Now, why is that? What is the cost that people should expect to be, spend on this sort of thing? Because I, I know myself, the range is vast, but even if you're paying $50 an hour, you're not necessarily getting $50 an hour value. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, it, it really just depends. I mean, we have marketing experts that charge 75 bucks an hour. We have agencies that are incredibly expensive too. They charge $5,000 a month. You, we also have agencies that might be on the cheaper side where you can start off with them and maybe eventually move up to a more expensive agency as you can afford it. So what you need to do is self-reflect and say, hey, what can I actually afford to take this risk and take this investment knowing that it might not work, even though you're going to do everything you can to make sure that it does and, and proceed from there. I mean, we have marketing experts who run our Facebook ads who charge over $50 an hour and we use them every week. And it's, it's huge for us. Instagram, it, it's not our main bread, bread and butter, although we've gotten some great clients off Instagram. And it's more of a smaller investment. We found an affordable agency that's $200 a month. So I try to stay away from the question, like, how much is this going to cost me? What's the estimated? How long is it going to take? That's really between the, the freelancer or the agency and the, or the agency and the client, because they're going to ask questions. They're going to figure out, hey, what, what kind of package, what kind of service can I offer you that's realistic? Yeah, but, but people want to know the range. And, then, and, and people don't even know. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, people... Sure. Some of the people don't even know what to expect. Like if you live in some town in America, like if you live in New York City, you might think that your first employee is going to cost you three to seven grand a month because that's the cost of living in New York City. But so if I were to tell you that you get someone that's as smart and confident and capable as what you would get in New York City, but you're only going to pay three, four hundred bucks a month for them. That might be really shocking for those people. Now, that doesn't mean that's always the case. And a lot of times, you know, you got to be careful. Like you said, you got to vet. It's not always really like it's it's a jungle out there, right? You, there are great deals to be found and great people who are really happy to be paid, you know, just a few hundred dollars. But, you know, you need to know what you're doing. And that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, can you speak to that landscape a little bit? Like, like if I hire a Filipino VA, am I going to get worse quality than I hire someone in the UK? You know, like, and, and, and... It's not, and again, both ways, it's not always the case. Like some people may want to say that, and maybe I'm just going to express my opinion, but you don't always get what you pay for. But at the same time, you, you do have to, you, you get what you inspect. So if you try to hire someone and you think you're going to get the same quality and you're only going to pay them three, $400, like you mentioned, you have someone doing your Instagram for 200, but you got other people that are 50 bucks a month. Well, you know, are you going to get different quality output or is it dependent on the person and their experience and where they're from? Any tips for that? Like, are there good, if you get where I'm going, I'm sorry. I feel like my question is as clear as I want it to be, but I do want your input on that because I know there's lots of people that are afraid of getting, of, of hiring the first person or they're afraid of the communication issue. 
of hire like they want to hire someone for low cost overseas or they they want to hire someone and they're okay to pay more to get a local but is that foolish like how do people get the best deal yeah so i can only speak for freelancers on our platform we, we mentioned the three sure. levels the the basic levels in that five to ten dollar an hour range non-us usually philippines not always but we're about 40 yep. percent philippines 40 percent us and 20 percent scattered um that mid-level range is usually in the 10 to 30 and the expert level range is in that 25 to 100 got it got it got it okay perfect that's great. That gives that helps people understand just for like a range. Cause if you've never hired online, you know, you might not know what to expect and all that stuff. So where do you see is the future of this industry? Where do you see this going in five, 10 years? What do we, what does the landscape look like? Are we all going to be replaced by AI bots, <laughs> you know, um, or is this going to be the norm is, you know, Elon Musk going to get low earth orbit satellites, giving high speed internet anywhere, everywhere. And that's going to change the face of the, of the, you know, the working world. What, what do you feel is the future? Yeah, so I can't predict AI, but I do know the gig economy is, is booming. Over the next 10 years, over 50% of the workforce is going to end up being remote. And there's so many benefits from hiring remote, both on the hiring side and the freelancer side. I mean, if you look at it from the freelancer side, they don't want to be dependent on one source of revenue where someone, if they get fired, they're out on the street. They want to build a mm -hmm. client portfolio. They don't want to drive to work every day. They want to work from home and have flexibility. We all know how unproductive working 10 hours in a row can be sometimes if you're not passionate about what you're doing. So there's so many benefits on both sides. You no longer need to hire a marketing expert for $150,000 a year anymore um, and, and bring them into your office. You can hire people remotely or on retainer or for project base. So it's only going in that direction. It's not going anywhere. It's only get, going to get bigger. And if you as a business owner, if you're not taking advantage of the gig economy, of the remote workforce, you're missing out and your competitors are or will be soon. Mm, mm, mm. Very, very well said. So now what about outsourcing sales? Any tips for that? That's a different animal than hiring someone for graphic design work or customer service or accounting. Is there any input from that? Is there any lessons that have you learned? Um, if someone has a sales team or wants to build a sales team and, and maybe even scale that sales team using your platform or any other platform, are there any do's and don'ts or lessons learned that you can share? about that experience in that particular field? Yeah. So sales is probably one of the last things that you're going to outsource. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many clients have, ha, have come and they're like, all right, I don't, I don't want to do sales. I don't like doing it. Um, I'm not good at it. Yeah, I, so, I just want to collect money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I want to do everything else. Just find me someone who can get me clients. And that, that doesn't work. You need a system. You need to process that. What I recommend doing is perfect your sales pitch first. If you don't have your one minute sales pitch where not every time, but for the most part, people leave it very positively and they want to engage and they want to stay in touch or they want to sign up and use your service. You need to keep working on that. You need to keep tweaking it. And a lot of people think they have it, but they haven't found it yet. So my sales pitch took me a year, a year and a half to really define. And now it's kind of the point where I can teach other people that and I'll, I'll give them feedback on it. It's a slow process. I mean, finding the right salesperson is tough. Finding, I strongly recommend staying away from, oh, I'll only pay you if you get me a sale. Like that that stuff doesn't work long-term where it's commission-based only. If, if you find someone like that, it's just a matter of time until they leave you. If they're that good of a salesperson where they can live yeah. just on commission, you're not going to have them very long and you're going to really struggle to find that person to begin with. So you have to get to the point where you can have a, a real sales budget. You can give someone a, a nice payment with maybe commission on top, something to motivate them is always good. Um, and you have a process where they can follow what worked for you, what you have gotten mm -hmm. to convert. And that is really the key. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you, and that's the, that's the one thing I wanted you to say that it's when you're going to hire people, especially for these high value uh, activities, you know, again, if someone's just doing data entry into an Excel spreadsheet, you know, that's maybe not the end of the world if they mess something up, but sales and they're out meeting the public and, you know, making first impressions for you and your company, it really needs to be something that you have vetted and proven and have documented. It's something that unfortunately, welcome to you are an entrepreneur selling what you do is part of, you know, that's the deal. That's the deal. You're not going to just show up and collect a paycheck and go home because you're going to do the work and and part of that work is figuring out how to even sell your product and teaching, figuring out a way to teach someone 
someone else how to sell your product or service as well. And once you've got that down and refined, then you can start bringing other people on board to help. But that's the mistake that I've made. I remember there was two girls when I was living in California. I hired two girls. They'd sold something similar. I thought because they sold something similar that they could be on board with me. And I hadn't done any of the phone sales stuff myself. And I've seen other people do it. And I'm just so glad you brought that up that it's it's just I understand that people listen to the call. It might not be the thing you want to do. But if you are the CEO, if it's your company, you need to learn how to sell your own product or service. You need to do it a few times and then you can bring other people on board and teach and train them because you have to be able to troubleshoot it. And if and when it's not working, you have to be able to jump in and do a sales call and show, you know what I mean? Like you have to be able to be jump in and train them and show them and coach them because it is something like, it's why it's called human resources, HR, because when you have someone that's trained up and can perform and execute for, with, for you and knows what you want and knows the standards and knows your processes, it is like, it is amazing. It's amazing to have a team of people like that um, where they can run things for you, whether you, you're at the hospital with a family member or you're on vacation or you just don't feel like working that hard that day. And all of a sudden you're not worried about paying to keep the lights on. That's an amazing place to be in and it's a worthy goal, but it's not something you can just, you know, go on and hire an expert and then just, you know, pay them, pay them over PayPal and then just disappear to the beach. You have to actually become your own expert in sales for your company. Yeah, that's a really important point. Unless you're willing to pay $150,000 a year starting plus commission and you can get a sales guru that's worked for a Fortune 500 company that can come in and crush it for you and build your entire sales process. But if you have a small budget and you're trying to get someone to come in and build your sales process on that budget, that's never going to work out. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. Nobody, nobody knows the product as well as you. Nobody knows the customers as well as you. So you have to be the guiding light. You've got to really figure it. And I think this is a really important point. That's why I'm kind of beating on it. You really have to iron it out. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you've got to be able to do that. And like, I love what you said there is that you have to be able to support your sales reps. You have to understand that they're in training that they, everybody wants to do good at their jobs. So they're going to do the best that they can, but they're going to need time to figure it out. And a lot of times sales isn't, it's not depending on the price point. If it's a low dollar item, sure. You might be able to set up a booth at a festival or something or in a, you know, a trade show and make sales. But if you're selling anything that's hundreds or even thousands of dollars, it, it's like the higher the price point, the longer the buying cycle. And so the longer, you know, if you have a 30 day buying cycle and you have a new sales rep, it's going to take 30 days before they get their first sale. But if they're not coming hot out the gates, right, then it's going to be 60, 90 days. I know people that have had sales staff on, on payroll for three to six months, uh, not six months, three to five months before the sales staff made their first sale. In fact, I know one guy, I'm not going to say his name, but he was four months selling a 2000 a month subscription service four months before he got his first sale and then he got his first sale and now he's averaging one or two sales a week for that company. Um, but you know, it took them eight, took them eight months to get to that. Exactly. I mean, it so. is a commitment and you're only as good as your process. If your process is great, yeah. you'll be able to get salespeople in and crushing it fast. If your process needs yeah. work, it's going to take a while. And, and I mean, with me, like I'm building out my biz development team now we're at, we're at that point. I'm, I'm outsourcing a lot of it because I'm very confident in my ability to do it, but it's collaboration. It's tweaking. It's seeing what works and what doesn't work and making changes and, and making the process as strong as possible. So can we talk about that a little bit? Like, how do you, how do you delegate effectively remotely when you're not able to sit down in the same office as someone? Is there like, you know, do I create a 30 page how to checklist? Should it only be one page? Should it be something, you know, should I break it into pieces that I can explain and, you know, and one minute segments? Like how, how, what is, you know what I mean? Like, what does that look like? How do I delegate effectively? Any recommendations? So our onboarding doc is over 50 pages long. And what I do is when I hire someone, I value my time at the highest possible level. So I'll hire them and I'll pay them for the first few days could be three days, five days, however long it takes. I'm more than happy to pay them for their time. And all they're doing during that time is reading the document and asking questions. And I'm there to support them. My team's there to support them. We'll answer everything. We're, we're nice about it and all that. But once they're done, we quiz them on it. We want to know how well do you know this SOP? Because one of two things is going to happen. Either they don't know it and I'm going to be respectful and I'm going to pay them and, and thank them for their time and get someone else and put them through the process, or they're going to get it. And that's when I start investing my time, my energy into them. And the other thing I do is I set expectations very early on, even before the training doc, is, is of what it's like to work with me and what the expectations are going to be. And scare probably isn't the right word, but for, all, for not having a better word, 
I scare them a little bit because I would much rather that they back out if they don't think they can meet those expectations than have them find it or have me find that out three weeks later. So we make sure that they're on the same page with expectations as black and white, black and white, cut and dry. We go through this process and only if they pass it, then I put their time in. And then we use Skype. It's very basic. We have group Skype chats. We have team leaders. Um, we're constantly communicating. We give them more information than they need at all times. We create an environment where we want them to not only ask questions, but once they get familiar with it, we want them to bring ideas of how they can improve it and make the processes better and more efficient. And it really all comes from the top down. If you're communicating with your team leaders effectively and you've taught them how to problem solve and how to communicate down and how to manage a team, that's how you slowly build it out and how how you scale and how you grow. Mm, mm, mm. So what was the best advice you've ever got on managing and a team? <laughs> the best advice I ever got um, was actually from that manager that, um, that I didn't like his management style, but he was very good at what he did. He, he told me that when you're hiring someone new, you, you really have to know what they're doing at all times. If you don't understand what they're doing, it, it's going to lead to a whole lot, lot of issues from mistakes to um, not being able to improve your processes or noticing where the flaws are um, to them communicating with other people and sharing wrong information or representing your company in a bad way. So just staying really on top of people, you don't necessarily need to be down their throat, but you should set that mentality where you're getting constant updates and put yourself in a position where you can randomly check in and really monitor people because that's how you know whether someone's going to be a success or failure is how quickly they can pick up on things, whether you have to repeat yourself and, and kind of what they do when no one's watching. Mm, that's a big one, what they do when no one's watching. So got it. So don't necessarily micromanage, but be daily and, and even maybe a couple times in the day checking in on them like, hey, all right, what's your goal today? You know, what's your, you know, what are you planning to accomplish today? Checking in, hey, how's it going? Are you stuck with anything? What's happening? And then at the end of the day, what did we accomplish today? And being okay with that and understanding that you might lose some of your, and I'm making air quotes here, your freedom as an owner, because now you've got to, I'm not, I'm just going to speak candidly here. You've got to babysit this new staff member, but also understand that it's an investment and that in babysitting this person, you're coaching them and helping set them up for success. So that way you can have more freedom later. And even if there's a churn, a churn, a turnover, because I know this is another frustration for a lot of people. They hire someone, they go through the hassle of training them, you know, they get them up and running and then a week later or something happens, it doesn't work out and they move on, right? That at least you, if you're refining that process, understand that, I guess what I want to say is understand that there is an investment to this and you may go through that a few times. It may be really frustrating, but it's one to teach you how to properly manage people and treat them like people and take care of them and make your place a place people want to work. But it's also an investment because you're building the asset. Like you might lose the time because you trained this person, they left, but what you've gained is you now hopefully are know how to train someone in that role better, hopefully have documentation to make it easier and smoother the next time. So you can make fewer mistakes mistakes that, you know, I'm moving forward and then finally get to that holy grail of having a team who will run and help grow your business without you. Is that fair to say? Would you add anything to that? Yeah, I would call it temporary supportive micromanaging where it's just up front until you, until they <laughs> earn your trust. You're, you're doing it in a supportive way where they want you to do it and you're not breathing down your throat and they know that you're helping them and that you want them to succeed and that it's in both of your best interests to work, work out. But at the end of the day, it is micromanaging because you are, you are monitoring what they're doing and making sure that they're doing what you think needs to get done in order for your business to succeed. Right, 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 right. Very well said. Very well said. So Nathan, this has been a fantastic call. We've covered a lot. We talked about kind of how you got started. We talked about some of the biggest obstacles and challenges with hiring people. We talked about the different levels of skills and expertise to hire. We even talked about some of the tasks that you would want to hire out in the beginning to buy your time back as the owner so you can focus on higher level things. A great quote is if I've heard is if you want to make $1,000 an hour, stop doing $10 an hour work. Mm -hmm. And so how to, how to start doing that, how to move yourself up your own org chart, your own ladder, how to delegate effectively, how to walk or crawl, walk, run into having an outsourced team, uh, how to avoid some of the common traps and how to make sure that you're kind of set up from success by setting expectations, managing the person properly at the beginning, creating documentation, knowing what you want, uh, making sure that the early stages are done well. Because when someone's up and trained, you do have to manage people still on an ongoing basis. But, you know, if you do it right in the beginning, if you hire right, you screen properly, you onboard them properly, it really sets you up 
in a great position for later on. And then we also talked about the future and where this is going and that this is kind of like the, 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 this is going to become more popular, not less popular. So as a business owner, if you're not hiring and building a team remotely using access to the world talent pool, you may be limiting yourself in a way that your competitors aren't and to be aware of that. Nathan, was there anything that I didn't ask you about that I should have asked you about? <laughs> no. Can I tell a little bit about free up and what we offer? Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Cool. So you can go to lots of marketplaces, post a job, get 50 people to apply, interview them one by one, and it just takes forever. And I always wanted a better way. So at FreeUp, we do it differently. We get thousands of applicants every week. We vet them for skill, attitude, communication, take the top 1%, let them in, and then make them available to our clients rapid fire whenever they need them. It's free to sign up. There's no monthly fee. There's no minimums. There's no obligation. You can stop using us at any time. It's in our best interest to make sure you get freelancers you like that actually help grow your business. We have freelancers from $5 to $75 an hour, U.S. and non-U.S. for over 100 skill sets. We have 24-7 support. My calendar is right on the website if anyone wants to book a free meeting with me. And lastly, we know how frustrating it is if someone quits on you and you have to start all over again. We have a no turnover guarantee. Freelancers on our platform mm. rarely quit. If they do for any reason, we cover all replacement costs and get you a new person right away. So that's really what we're wow. about. Um, the pre-vetting, the speed, the customer service, and the protection. That's awesome. That's awesome. And do you guys do the management? Like, is there a time tracker on your site as well? Or do does somebody have to get something else like Time Doctor? Or how does it work? Yeah, no, we have our own software um, that we've spent three years building. The freelancers start time, end time, leave notes when they work. If you want something more advanced, you're welcome to use Time Doctor or whatever. Um, they obviously, that's their focus and they have a lot of cool sure. features. We partner with them actually. Um, but yeah, I mean, mm. all the, I would say 99% of our clients love our software. And for the ones that want um, more stuff than that, they can always use Time Doctor and send an adjustment to our software. Yeah, no, all good, all good. No, no, I mean, if you have something built in, that's great. Time Doctor, Liam's a great guy. I know him, he's a friend. He's actually been on our show already. Uh, but that's cool, that's fantastic. So you've got it all in one platform. And what what sort of ideal do you have for people or where do they go if they're interested in getting getting involved and getting you know their first remote or their next remote worker? Yeah, so anyone that signs up, mention this podcast, get a free $25 credit. Um, I mentioned my calendar's right at the top of the site if, if you want to book a time with me. Um, and me and my team are here to help you and support you when you grow as you grow your business. And where do they go? Just freeup.com? How do they mention the, the podcast? Yeah, free up with three E's, F-R-E-E-U-P.com. Uh, when you sign up, there's a part of how do you hear about us? Just write it in there. Perfect. So go to freeup, F-R-E-E-E-up.com. Check it out. Get yourself someone. If you don't have any staff, if you are a one-person show, you need to hire someone right now. You need to. Just if only to figure out what you can outsource to other people. If that's the only thing you can do is hire someone to help you figure out what you can delegate to get free more of your time, you have to buy your time back as a business owner. It's one of the most important things you could do. Remember, you're, as a business owner, it's not up to you to have a job. It's up to you to create jobs for other people. You're responsible for building the machine that gets the thing done. When, when someone's hungry and they go through the McDonald's drive through there's never like a sign going, hey, sorry, Timmy's sick. Like that just doesn't happen because they have a pool of staff that they can call on because the business exists to serve a community. And you have to understand that, that what you do is there to serve a community larger than you. And if it's only you, you're actually doing your customers a disservice by sometimes being available, sometimes not, sometimes being at your best, sometimes not. You need a team of people who can be trained up and ready and willing and able to serve your, your customers on a regular basis and to help you move up the ladder so you can find more of these people to serve because it'll make you more money. So once again, if you're interested, go check out freeup.com. Nathan, thank you so much for your time today. I know there's a lot of things you could be doing. I definitely appreciate you. This is a major topic, something everybody on this call needs to master. It's not just a pitch for free. Yep, I don't really get anything out of it if you sign up. But just in general, it is in your best interest to become a master at delegating and outsourcing. You know, I remember that uh, one of my mentors used to say, delegate as much as you can so you can focus on analyzing the stats and copywriting or selling. Like, do delegate as much as you can so you can analyze based on stats and focus on the marketing and the sales. And uh, I think that's a really good formula for success in any business. So thanks and thank you so much. Is there anything else I should have asked you that I didn't? <laughs> no, you have a great rest of the night. Thanks again for having me. You've reached the end of our interview. Now, first, let me thank you for listening. I appreciate and respect you more than you'll ever know. 
And now I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. First, what three lessons did you just learn? What three aha moments just jumped out at you? Second, what can you implement for yourself and your business in the next 24 hours? Third, what can you give to someone else to help you with or give them to just do it for you? Whatever it is, remember taking action is the secret sauce to results. Now, if you think this interview would be helpful for a friend, please give them a link to it. It'll help them and it'll help me too. I'd also like to invite you to help me find out more about the challenges you're facing, your dreams, your goals, and how I can help you overcome what's holding you back. We both do better when we know better, and your success is my success. So please reach out and interact. You can visit our website, bestbusinesscoach.ca for Canada or California, where I'm from and where I'm living. You're welcome to also try out one of our paid programs. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and pretty much every other social media channel you can think of. You should also subscribe to the podcast. And if you're enjoying them, please leave us a nice review. It really helps. That's all for now. Once again, thank you. Take care of yourself. And remember, the world needs the best business you can build. And I believe in you.